almost time. Our program will begin soon. Please take your seats. Hello, hello. Welcome back to the Code for America Summit. We are going to round out this Friday afternoon with a full hour of demystifying procurement. What could be more interesting? Um, so thank you for being here and joining us, whether you're in the room or on the live stream. Uh, to start off our conversation around procurement, please join me in welcoming to the stage Annie Teeve from Multnomah County in Oregon and Marielle Reed, the co-founder and CEO of CoProcure. Welcome. Well, hi everyone. My name is Mariel Reed. I'm the co-founder and CEO of CoProcure. 
We're a, a technology startup here in the Bay Area that's working to build tools that make it easier for public agencies to collaborate on procurement. I'm also a former public servant with the city of San Francisco. Hi, everyone. I'm Annie Teeve, and I'm in central purchasing at Multnomah County um, in Portland, Oregon. And fun fact, it is the largest county in the state of Oregon. And we are obsessed with public procurement and think that you all should be too. <laughs> so why be obsessed with procurement? Well, from designing better digital services to improving school lunches, fixing potholes, and addressing homelessness, all of these things that government do, it relies on procurement. Yeah, so procurement is massive. Roughly one out of every three of our government dollars go towards buying something. At the local level in the US alone, that's over a trillion dollars that we spend on buying stuff each year. Also, if you care about social justice, you probably should care about procurement. Uh, procurement matters because um, the way that we buy things and how quickly we buy things affects our ability to deliver public services. And therefore, it affects also uh, those who depend on our public services. In addition, because government business is big business, which firms win government contracts and the composition of those firms matters for the future of economic development across the country. And finally, if we don't have you hooked just yet, you should care about public purchasing because whether you're a supplier like Co-Procure or you're in government like me, Procurement is probably part of your painful reality. So we have a couple of goals for today's conversation. First, we want to help you understand how public purchasing works at the local level. Second, we want to equip you with tools you can use to make navigating public purchasing a little bit easier. And third, we want to invite you to join us and a growing group of public servants and suppliers working together to improve the process. So first, let me get you the lowdown on procurement. Procurement is a lot like plumbing. Plumbing, it's not the first thing you notice, right? As long as it's working. You turn on the faucet, water comes out. You don't really have to think about how to engineer those pipes as long as you can drink it. Similarly, procurement, it manages the flow of money in and out of government. Uh, the process is intended to connect government staff with the goods and the services that they need to perform mission-critical work. And they need to do this in a way that is open, competitive, and fair. But that process today, it's kind of hard, and it's expensive, and it's a little leaky. Not good in plumbing, right? <laughs> Um, it doesn't work as well as it can or it should for public servants, for businesses, or for the residents of the communities that we serve. We can estimate that across the country, local government purchasing inefficiencies cost taxpayers $300 billion a year. Why all the waste? Before you go blaming public servants like Annie, <laughs> Pause and recognize that because public agencies are spending our taxpayer dollars, the way that they spend that money is regulated. Roughly, the more money you want to spend in public service, the more hoops you have to jump through to spend those funds. So here are the hoops. That first category, not a lot of rules. Low dollar amount you want to spend, so you can pretty much make a purchase at your own discretion. And that next category of spend we have is called informal bidding. Um, typically speaking, you go out, you do three to five quotes, and you can satisfy the procurement rules of purchasing. Yeah, but get to the next level, and you trigger the dreaded request for proposals process. So you hit a certain dollar threshold, and you're required in government to purchase off of a contract that's been created through a formal competitive bidding process. Yeah. So by the way, it's worth noting that about 80% of local government spend falls in that category. And it's also worth noting that the dollar threshold that triggers that requirement can vary quite a bit location to location. So in some cities, like the city of St. Louis, it's as low as $5,000. Just across the bay in the city of San Francisco, it's about $10,000. So just to recap, if you're in government and you want to spend sometimes as little as $5,000, you must purchase off of a contract that's been created through competitive bidding. 
So what's the problem? <laughs> so <laughs> creating those competitively bid contracts, it's a lot of work. It's so much work and it's so many processes that I can't even remember them off the top of my head. So I made this procurement macarena that I'm about to do, and you all are welcome to join me in doing this. <laughs> we would appreciate it if you would join us, but hopefully this will help you remember all the steps in the competitive bidding process. <laughs> and so it goes a little like this. First, you got to do your market research. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and then you are going to have to write that solicitation. Get all those requirements. That's right. And then, you don't want to do it again, and then <laughs> you're going to have to publish and advertise that solicitation. For at least six weeks in some places, maybe more. That's right. And then you're going to have to receive and evaluate those responses. <laughs> and then you're going to have to decide, which supplier am I going to work with? And you better hope that no one protests the process or has any complaints about that process, because you're going to have to spend a lot of time in protest period. Then and we're done, right? No, no, no. No, we're not done yet. <laughs> and then we will go and negotiate. <laughs> and then after that, yeah, we may arrive at a competitively bid contract. Whew. All right. So. <laughs> <laughs> That little dance there took us, what, like 15, 20 seconds? How long does it take in your experience, Annie? Uh, yeah, so from my experience, um, it's taken anywhere from about four months to uh, 24 months. Ooh, all right. So what you're telling me is in government, it is time consuming and expensive to create these new competitively bid contracts. Yeah. Is that right? That's correct. But for suppliers? <laughs> Ditto. <laughs> The real rub is that this process is oftentimes also redundant. So there are almost 90,000 local agencies across the country, and they spend over a trillion dollars each year on similar goods and services. Even though these places are really special, the problems that they're trying to solve and the things that they're buying to address those challenges are not. That means that in most cases, local governments are creating their own contracts. So you have only almost 90,000 agencies doing that procurement macarena to buy a range of things, but they don't need to. That's right. We don't need to. There's this thing, this tool that I want <laughs> everybody here to know about, and it's called cooperative purchasing. We wanted to channel <laughs> Oprah a little bit in that moment. Cooperative purchasing. <laughs> no, she wanted to. If you walk away from this conversation <laughs> with <laughs> Any, anything to take away, it is that cooperative purchasing is a tool, whether you're in government or on the supplier side, that you can use to lower the costs of buying and selling in local government and make the process overall more efficient. Yeah. Basically, cooperative purchasing is just the idea that, local, that governments can share the procurement process. It can happen in a few different ways. It can happen when governments get together, do that procurement dance together, and create a shared contract that they can use to make a purchase. And it can also happen a little less synchronously. One agency can do that work, create the contract, and other agencies, if they can find that work, can actually purchase directly off that contract on the same terms from the same vendor without having to run their own new competitive bidding process from scratch. That's right. So cooperative purchasing, a couple of key things to know. Yes, it is legal. We get this question a lot. Is cooperative purchasing a hack? Is it a loophole? Is it a workaround? And the answer is no. It's actually a legal best practice, and it's in the American Bar Association model procurement code. That means across the US, most states, and most local governments, with very few exceptions, all allow for cooperative purchasing. Yeah, so cooperative purchasing, it saves me a lot of time and money. <laughs> That's right. So the time savings are pretty intuitive. If someone else is running an administrative process and you benefit from that process, that saves you the work and the time of having to do that same process over again. And um, particularly relevant for this audience and over these last couple of days as we're talking about innovative uh, practices, tools, technologies, um, cooperative purchasing is uh, awesome for being able to access innovation faster. So when that time to procure matters more because that technology or solution that you want to acquire might not be relevant in 24 months, cooperative purchasing can, can help expedite that buying process. 
And the final piece, of course, is that it can save money. So if public agencies are aggregating their purchasing power, they're able to achieve lower prices overall for the goods and services that they need to buy. And cooperative purchasing, it not only is helpful for us in government, but it's also helpful for all suppliers out there because it reduces the cost of our selling. Yeah, so if you're in government, you should be paying attention, but if you're on the supplier side, you should also know about cooperative purchasing mm -hmm. because the default way of selling into government is one-to-one. -one. You're writing a love letter every time you submit that RFP and, uh, and hoping to win that contract from that one government agency. But with cooperative contracts, you can go through that single process and emerge with a contract you can use to change your selling from one-to-one -to, -one to one to many. And cooperative purchasing, guess what? Any government at any level of, of purchasing can create these contracts. Yeah, so this is another crazy thing. Um, governments are already churning out these contracts at various levels. So some of you might be familiar with uh, federal work. You may have heard of national purchasing cooperatives or regional purchasing groups. And uh, in addition to those groups, state agencies and local agencies can also create cooperative contracts as well just means running that competitive bidding process and including some language in the solicitation and the contract that says that the contract can be shared. That's right. So cooperative purchasing, it's already happening. Yeah, so this is the final big point about co-op purchasing, which is that it's not new, um, it's not a recent innovation, it's something that's an established practice. And even though governments across various levels are already creating these different contracts and they're spread out across a lot of different places, already governments are finding those contracts and using them whatever they can. At the local level, about 20% of purchasing goes through, purchasing spend, excuse me, goes through these contracts today, which is over $200 billion each year. Yeah, that work, it's already happening. Um, as a matter of fact, we're already collaborating. In the Portland metropolitan area, um, I lead a group of government buyers um, where we get together on the regular and we kind of sit down, we hash it out, we talk about these contracts we've got out on the streets um, and what we can share. We kind of took it up a step up a notch and we uh, sat down and we got this great idea to write it all down in an Excel spreadsheet. Really nifty, really cool work. Um, but then we heard about this opportunity where we can take our contracts and we can share it on a national level and really help governments everywhere. Um, and that opportunity came when we heard about Coprocure. So we're working together because fundamentally we believe there should be more collaboration in procurement. Coprocure is a uh, mission-driven technology startup based here in Oakland that's building the infrastructure to collect all of these contracts that are spread out over all of these different places and make it really easy for buyers to quickly um, find and compare and use those contracts that already exist. So our goal is for buyers like Annie to be able to know pretty quickly, hey, is there work out there that I can already use or do I have to start this process from scratch on my own? Uh, we're also totally free for public agencies and want this data to be open and accessible. So you can go ahead and try it now and contribute at any time. That's right. So we believe that collaboration, it will transform public procurement. By collaborating together, we can be more transparent in where this money is going to be going. We're going to be more efficient in how we spend this money, and we can share this money among many more diverse groups of suppliers. But we can't do it without your help. Here are just three things that you can do right now to improve your purchasing experiences. And the best part of it all, you don't have to change any rules or regulations. Number one, don't reinvent the wheel. Yeah, make checking out contracts that already exist part of your procurement processes. Start your searches on Coprocure. Even if you can't buy off of a contract, you can still expedite your procurement processes and improve your benchmarking just by starting with something that's already there, right? And if you're going to borrow from others, you should probably be better at sharing your own stuff too. Yeah, whether you're in government or you're a supplier, we should all be working to push to have cooperative language as part of our bids and our contracts. If you don't see cooperative language in a contract, just ask. Um, publish your contract data through Coprocure, through any means that you possibly can, but Coprocure is free, so why not there? 
um, other governments can use that information and really expedite their processes. And then finally, we should be using cooperative purchasing to help onboard new suppliers and allow them to grow. That's right. We could use cooperative language to help us achieve our supplier diversity goals. It's not enough for one agency to create and award one contract for suppliers. We in government, we need help to award contracts that allow suppliers to grow their businesses. So procurement matters a lot. And if you're in government or you're selling into government, you probably already know that. And yeah, it's a little bit painful, but if we work together, we can make it better. Co-Procure is working with a growing group of public servants and suppliers across the country to improve public purchasing. And we really hope you'll join us. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Marielle and Annie. All kinds of good stuff happening with procurement. Um, and next up to tell us more is Dave Zvenich, procurement nerd. Welcome, Dave. All right, good afternoon, y'all. We're going to talk about procurement. I'm going to tell all of the vendors how you're going to get all that sweet government money. I'm going to tell all of you public employees about how you're going to work with the best vendors. And we're all going to do it on Friday afternoon here at CFA Summit. So first, I just want to explain a little bit about why you should care about public procurement. You already heard, it's a lot of money, right? $3 billion or something, something crazy, like $150 billion each year from the federal government for federal programs and then state and local programs through federal dollars. You heard about the 30 plus billion dollars that happens uh, at the state and local level, or at the, the local level. And you heard about the pain, right? Let me ask, let me actually touch on the pain here. By a show of hands, how many of you are actually purchasing, uh, purchasing officials? Okay, I got a couple. How many of you have had experiences with procurement? Okay. Keep your hands up if you had a bad experience with procurement. Okay. Keep your hands up if you want to solve procurement. All right, put those hands down. So this actually happens to everybody that deals with digital services. So one of my former colleagues, Sasha McGee, who's with the uh, city of San Francisco, had, had this tweet, called it the digital services progression. Year one, procurement is so boring. Why y'all talk about procurement so much? Year two, man, procurement is a pain. Year three, we should really consider doing something about procurement. Year four, holy crap, there is nothing more important than solving procurement. Does this reflect everybody's experience here? Yep. So here's the problem. Procurement's hard. It's really hard. But why is it so hard? Well, we heard about the procurement competitive bidding process, but it's important to understand why you go through that process in the first place. And the problem is, there's no perfect way to do procurement because you actually have competing goals. Number one, competition. You want there to be a competitive process. Why? Because we believe that when you have competition, the best solution wins. All right, then you've got integrity. We care about the fact that these are taxpayer dollars. You want to make sure that these tax taxpayer dollars are not going to a friend of a political official. Instead, you want it to make sure that it's going to the best vendor. You want there to be transparency. You want to make sure that everyone understands how taxpayer dollars are being used. You have efficiency. Hold on a second. Efficiency, you want to make sure that this process goes fast. But wait, you also just had this competition, integrity, and a transparency process. You want it to be a customer satisfaction experience where you want the buyer to be really satisfied. Well, what if the buyer doesn't want to have competition or integrity or transparency or efficiency? But wait, there's more. You still have best value. You want to make sure that the dollars that you spend are actually the best thing for the government, even if it's not the fastest, even if it's not the, uh, even if it's not the thing that get, brings the most satisfaction. Then you also have wealth distribution. We have all these other considerations. We want women and small, own, uh, small businesses, minority-owned businesses. We want uh, service-disabled veteran-owned small businesses to be able to uh, access government contracts uh, and to remedy past, uh, past discrimination. But then you also have risk avoidance, right? We don't want to create a lot of risk. That's, that's crazy. We want to make sure that we keep our risks minimal. And then on top of that, you want uniformity. 
right? We should be able to have the same thing across all of the agencies. So you've got these goals, and you can see how they, how they are at tension with each other. And so how does this really play out in practice? Well, let's take an example. How many designers in the room? Got some designers in the room? All right, handful. All right, so let's say you're a designer. Put, your head in the, uh, put yourself in the head of a, uh, uh, of a designer. You love Photoshop. So you're like, hey, I want Photoshop, right? And you say, I really need Photoshop to do my job effectively. That's how I get all of my, uh, all of my graphics done. So go to the contracting officer and say, I would like to buy Photoshop. Well, where's the competition, right? Oh, that's a competing goal. Uh, what about the transparency associated with how you made that decision? So then you come across somebody who's like, uh, why don't you just use Sketch? We already have Sketch. Uh-oh, right? So someone's like, I've got Photoshop, I want Photoshop. But someone else is like, why don't you just use Sketch? What about uniformity? So then they say, I got it. You know what? If you want Photoshop, I've got a solution for you. Just give me some documentation, right? Justify it. Create some paperwork that explains why Photoshop is going to be better than Sketch, and Sketch won't cut it. All right, so take a moment and think about the tools that you use every day. And imagine justifying why for every single tool that you use, why that's the best tool for your job. If you start to think about that, things get really complicated. So if you think this through, eventually you go, yeah, you know what, forget it. I don't even need Photoshop. I'm fine with Sketch. Um, and you just then throw your hands up and say, procurement, unalterably broken. This needs to be fixed, right? And if you think that this is some sort of unique thing in government, realize in the technology space, engineers can't even agree whether Vim is better than Emacs. Answer Vim. Um, also, you can't answer whether it's GIF or GIF, right? So how documenting thing A versus thing B is actually going to pass muster under the light of public scrutiny is actually a really difficult thing. And when you play these conversations out at scale, well, that's why procurement is hard. Oh, and don't forget one other thing. Whatever you decide, someone after the fact is going to come and say, you made the wrong decision. Disgusting. No one should pronounce it as GIF. All right? So that's one reason why procurement hard, but it's only half the reason, maybe not even the most important half, because there's the other part, which is that once you actually get the contract, delivery is really hard, right? Like, it's not super easy to deliver a really important system. It's not really easy to just get the thing that you need. Sometimes you have to integrate with other systems. Sometimes you have to plan for uh, different user needs that pop up. Sometimes you actually just have to have access to the users in the first place. So when you have a contract in place, that's actually not going to even guarantee success. So if we accept the fact that going through the process is hard and then the delivery is hard, well, that's why you sort of start to say, we need to solve for public procurement. But here I'm going to suggest a different approach. Stop trying to solve procurement. Instead, we need to shift our focus. What do I mean? So before I got really into procurement, I was really into local politics. And the thing that I learned in local politics is that there's actually five T's. Has anyone heard about the five T's? So these are the five T's of local government. Teachers, trash, taxes, traffic, trees. If you touch any of those five T's, boy, you better expect some excitement from the residents of your community, right? Don't pick up that trash, you'll get those phone calls. You don't pay your teachers, you'll get those calls. People can't get to and from work in the morning, you'll get those calls. So those five T's are the things that if you ignore them, it's at your own peril, okay? So if we think about the five T's of public procurement, we actually might get the right focus. So what are those five T's? Teams, trade-offs, transparency, tools, and tempo. Let's talk about them one at a, t uh, one at a time. So teams. I start with teams because this is actually the most important thing. It turns out that the biggest problem from a procurement perspective is that people don't plan their team 
soon enough. They wait till the very end, if ever, when they form their acquisition team. What do I mean by that? So usually what happens is that you have the program, right? I have a need. I'm a designer. I need Photoshop. So then what do you do? You go to your IT department and you say, hey, I need Photoshop. And then the IT department says, well, we don't have Photoshop, so we have to go talk to the contracting officer. So then they go to the contracting officer and they say, hey, I need Photoshop. And the contracting officer says, I don't know what Photoshop is. We got Sketch. That seems fine. You go through that process. But then after that, here's the crazy thing. As part of the Macarena, you still have to go talk to the lawyers. You still have to go to talk to budget. You still have to go talk to the competition advocate and the small business department and all of the other players who are actually involved in a procurement. And then check this out. Even after you've done all that process, then you go talk to industry who's never dealt with any of these uh, conversations beforehand. And you're like, uh, yo, can you just respond to this RFP? So part of the problem is that we don't form our acquisition team soon enough. If instead of having this sequential swim lane serial conversation, we actually had a conversation, your contracting officer, your program, your technical evaluation panel, your IT department, you put them all together, suddenly you've got a team. So instead of pointing fingers at each other, we can actually be the superheroes that we need. All right, so that's teams. You know, if you think that this is some crazy talk here, right, like you couldn't do teams, understand this is actually what the federal acquisition regulations require. They say that the goals of the federal acquisition regulations are teamwork, unity of purpose, and open communication among the members of the team and sharing the vision and achieving the goal. If you start there, good things happen. So that's team, that's uh, team number one. And you need to make sure that you empower them and have cross-domain expertise. Now, one thing too, I've talked about the acquisition team, but I want to take a moment and talk about the vendor team as well, right? Because if you're going to go hire a vendor team, here's what you need to understand. You're actually not hiring a solution. You're not hiring a service. You're not hiring past performance. You're not hiring key personnel. You are hiring a team. You are always going to be hiring a team. Even when you're buying a product, you're inheriting those team's practices. So understand that the, de the, the vendor is actually going to be bringing their team's practices into government, and so you need to be selecting for the best teams. Team's critical. All right, T, num T number one. Let's talk about team number two, trade-offs. So check this out. You got your team. You're ready to roll. You think your work is done. But the reality is quite different. The reality is that when you are delivering digital services, you are constantly making trade-offs, right? Whether it's product decisions about which features to include and which features to exclude, whether it's what vendor to select because you're making the technical trade-off versus the price trade-off, you're always gonna be making trade-offs. So in practice, the reason that trade-offs are so important is because we have to stop getting away from the how and start describing the why. So here's the thing, here's a lie in two truths. Number one, government managers know what they want for the most part. <laughs> That's the lie. Here are the two truths. Most professional services firms are tragically undifferentiated. Most vendors who deliver to government, they claim they're different. They claim that they do some special sauce, but you know what they all do? They all do Agile, they all do DevOps, they all do user-centered design, they all do AI, they all do blockchain, they do cloud, they do whatever you want, right? They will all do whatever you want, and they are tragically undifferentiated. And part of the problem is that most government buyers are woefully under-informed. Under because when they go out to the market and they say, what do you do? They say, we do Agile, we do DevOps, we do uh, user-centered design, we do cloud, we do AI, we do whatever you want, right? And so part of the problem that we have is that we are pretending. We are pretending that there are differentiations when they're not. So here's what I think we should do. We should stop pretending and start prioritizing. We should actually decide for ourselves what's important from a vendor and then get that from the vendor. And if we don't actually focus on what are those meaningful distinctions between companies, how do, they how do they get their teams together? How do they empower their teams? How do they get involved with users? How do they make meaningful decisions 
based from user research? How do they manage the trade-offs of delivery? How do they manage uh, confidentiality, integrity, and availability? How do they handle those trade-offs? That's the type of question that we need to stop, uh, start asking and instead say, oh, do you do Agile? Neat. Check that box. Because if we don't make some of these trade-offs, we're going to end up buying the Homer, right? And in the Homer, the deal was that they got every feature that you wanted, right? The problem is there ain't, ain't, so, ain't no such thing as a free lunch, and that's according to Ethics Council, probably. That's a laugh line. I mean, I, I know it's late, y'all, but like free lunch, council, government gifts, ethics, come on. All right, let's move on to transparency. So the third T is transparency. It's actually not that obvious, but transparency is almost as important as the thing that's being delivered. If you buy a thing, but the public doesn't realize that you bought the right thing, you're not going to get credit. So part of what you need to do is you need to figure about how you can work in the open. Because being open is better, even if it's harder. And I've always been able to find in my own experience that when you choose to work in the open, you're going to get better results. Whether that's open source software, whether that's being transparent with your users about what you're going to deliver and what you're not going to deliver, whether that's how much do things cost and how much are you not sure about what it should cost? Transparency is often messier, but in my experience, you're going to get better results when you open yourself up to observation. Just a reality. And then we get to tools. I love tools. Here's the thing that's crazy about tools. Remember the Photoshop thing and the sketch thing? For some reason, and I don't know why this happens, people assume that tools are all the same thing, right? But if you look at this knife, you know that you wouldn't use a knife, a chef's knife, to butter your bread, right? It's a knife, it's a butter knife. You wouldn't use a chef's knife and use it as a Swiss Army knife, right? So we accept in real life that there are different tools for different occasions. So. The interesting thing is that when it comes to governments and it comes to people exercising the craft of delivery, we need to start accepting that people need the right tool for the right job. And so if you are in a CIO shop, or if you are working for an uh, organization where you're saying, we need to standardize on these tools, ask yourself, before we standardize, are we actually getting the right tool for the job? That'll save a lot of pain. And then the last thing is tempo. So tempo, <laughs> tempo is funny, right? So everyone, has, heard, has anyone heard this? Move fast and break things, right? You've heard that, right? What about we need to have delivery at the speed of innovation, right? Heard that, something like that. What about procurement is so slow, we need to be fast, right? Heard that? Well, to me, this is silly. We don't need to focus on speed. We need to focus on tempo. Because the problem is, moving fast and breaking things is what gets you, <laughs> gets you fired from FedEx driver, crane operator, surgeon. You get the idea, right? So moving fast and breaking things is really, really, really bad when you're dealing with the public good. Breaking the public trust is something that should get you fired. So instead of thinking about speed, we need to think about tempo, and specifically, allegro monotropo, which means fast, but not too fast. Because if you focus on the tempo and you have that cadence and you understand how your flow and your movement, you're actually going to be able to get better results. So that means managing your work in progress, it means focusing on small batches, measuring the cost of delay, all of the things that we talk about in product management, but applying those same principles to procurement is actually gonna get you the right outcomes. All right, so we've got these five T's. Teams, trade-offs, transparency, tools, and tempo. And I want you to think about those tools, or excuse me, those T's, when you think about the question of solving procurements. Because procurement is hard. Procurement matters, and we can only make it better together. 
But once you've started to embrace the concepts that procurement is actually not something that needs to be solved, but instead is a practice, you can achieve the next level. If level one is procurement is boring, level two is procurement's a pain, level three is procurement feels important, level four is nothing more is not more important than solving procurement, level five is using the phrase excited to get this one home safely uh, in, get this one home and in the barn safely when talking about a purchase order. That is the level that we need to achieve. That is the true wisdom of approaching public procurement. So I will ask you today, as you go home and you think about the next time you, uh, someone says, we need to solve procurement, we need to fix procurement, don't try. Instead, practice the five T's of public procurement. Work in teams. Use the trade-offs, work in the open, empower the teams with the right tools, and focus on the tempo to deliver for the public. Thank you very much. So we have a little bit of time before we end. Uh, and so uh, Annie and Mari are going to join us. Uh, and Corey is going to answer any questions that you all may have. I will not answer questions. <laughs> I'm sorry. Corey is going to have the microphone uh, so that we mic can answer Well, you ask a question. That's, so if that's you have a I mean. question for Dave, Marielle, or Annie, come join me over here, and we'll get it right up to them. Questions? These are some of our nation's procurement gurus. Take advantage. Come on up. Oh, you're going to hold it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for speaking first. I'm Tariq. I'm a co-organizer for Code for Atlanta, um, but I also work in supply chain. Uh, my question is about your tool that you were talking about. Could you give us some examples of you know, contracts that have been executed, that have been shared among like local government, state government, et cetera? Well, I can speak from what we're seeing on the platform and some of the transactions we've helped facilitate so far. And then maybe, Annie, you can share also a little bit about what you've done in practice from the contracts that you've created or the types of contracts that you've facilitated through the Columbia chapter. Does yeah. that sound good? For sure. Cool. So um, the crazy part, as you likely know, is that government really is an industry of industries. And um, in the last month alone, we've seen um, contracts for things like snowplow blades um, to uh, software that helps um, governments track uh, diverse suppliers better. So it really is a whole range of stuff. Um, in general, across the country, obviously, it's easier to share contracts geographically uh, for things like software um, or certain kinds of commodities. Um, you know, if you're buying in bulk, it's worth shipping. Um, for other things like services, if you need someone to do construction or regular paving or routine maintenance, you're probably going to want someone local. So one of the really cool things um, that we think about kind of opening up this, uh, this purchasing mechanism that's already happening and kind of making it a little more transparent and easy to navigate is the contracts for the big stuff are already out there. So the stuff that can be shared across the country, those vendors are already on contract with GSA, with their states, with some of these national co-ops. But the part that we haven't unlocked yet is local agencies are actually also creating these shareable contracts with local vendors and more diverse suppliers. So the really cool part there is we've actually seen, hey, if you need paving services, you don't really want to buy off of a, a contract that's created at like the federal level or by another state. You want someone local. You want to know who are the folks that can do that work that maybe other uh, agencies in my area are using or could be using. So um, I think we're kind of just getting started, aggregating all this stuff that's really easy to find at first at the state and national cooperative level. But we're starting to also get a glimpse of the sharing and the kinds of economic uh, opportunities we could unlock when we get better at sharing at that local level. Yeah, and I can actually say that it's only gotten easier to share contracts very much 
more so very recently um, with tools like these nifty tools that you guys are all working on. That's how we're sharing these contracts. Um, we're, we found Co-Procure to be able to put all of our contracts on there. I think like Sacramento County, if anybody's from there, has like shared all of their contracts on that platform, which is pretty cool. Um, at Multnomah County, we are actually trying to do that through this thing. You probably all know what it's called, like an API, whatever that means, <laughs> from our e-procurement system onto that platform. Um, sorry, I don't know tech, so API, this thing. I'm working on it. <laughs> um, and we're doing this at Multnomah County. Um, cooperative purchasing language, I've seen in the last four years that I've been in government really significantly grow. That language was not always kind of standard. Um, and I'm seeing more and more at other local government agencies. They're trying to include that cooperative sentence, that paragraph. It's like three sentences long in most of their procurements um, and then hopefully in their contracts so that we can all share that work that we're all using. So. Just to, to put it at the federal level, uh, federal GSA Schedule 70, which is the IT contract for uh, federal, federal purchasing, uh, has a cooperative purchasing clause uh, that you can choose. And then if you are on Schedule 70, you can actually sell to state and local governments if state, state law allows. Yeah. Annie and Mari, where can folks find that three sentence? magic nugget to include in contracts? Well, we have some uh, writing that's coming out in part potentially co-authored with Code for America that'll be out soon. Um, but yeah, we've gotten a lot of questions. What we found is buyers like Annie know about this, but public servants doing the work or needing the tools, if they haven't spoken with their procurement or they're a little scared of their procurement teams, um, don't often know that this mechanism exists. So, um, and neither do suppliers, especially if they're smaller suppliers. Mm -hmm. So we're starting to write more content to also help folks get a, get a grasp on, hey, if we want to put cooperative language into a contract, can we borrow? Can we at least take a look at what other agencies are using? And for suppliers as well, a couple things to think about are making sure that language is in the original bid solicitation and the resulting contract. And then thinking also about how you um, craft your, or articulate your pricing schedule or the uh, items or services that might be purchased off of that contract in a flexible enough way that other agencies can take a look and understand, OK, this is how we'd work with this group. OK. Hi, I'm Dan Fay. I'm from uh, Code for Sacramento. Um, I was just curious, and you may have sort of answered this a little bit, but how are you getting like most of your contracts into the into the system? It sounds like there might be some like existing systems through APIs. Um, are there also just like bulk uploads or like you know emails or something? Yeah. I'm yeah, curious. I can actually answer that. So on CoProcure's website, there's actually literally a blue button you can click that says "Share your contracts." So I can drag all my contract documents and share it on there. And actually, it saved me a lot of time. So for example, I've got this construction contract um, that it's, I've got a lot of people asking about. It's called job order construction contracting. It's kind of this new contracting method. But anyways, in the local area, not very many people have been able to successfully go out for a procurement for it. Um, and if they would like to just try it out, um, this is a great way for them to try it. Um, there's cooperative language in my contract. And instead of just sending it via email to like 10 people a week, what I can do is I can just drop it in that um, portal and upload it there, and I can just tell them, hey, go to coprocure.us, and they're able to find it there. It's pretty cool. Yeah, so there is a lot of data that's out there in addition. So uh, at the local agency level, that gets a little trickier because you're talking about how do we integrate with your e-procurement systems, or you know, if someone in your network has requested a contract, how do you share that you know, through a tool that's more replicable rather than just via email kind of one-to-one. -one. So that drag and drop is available. There's also, we have our hands full really aggregating a lot of the data that's already published and it's out there. It just lives across, you know, the, the dozen or 20 or so tabs that a really experienced buyer like Annie would open up and kind of flip back and forth through. So we're really just starting by aggregating and pulling in a lot of that public content. Um, and then with certain agencies that are a little bit, um, I guess, more proactive or eager to share, um, we're either able to scrape if they already publish their contracts. Um, so St. Louis County in Missouri, for instance, was like, how do we get on there? And they and uh, we had a little back and forth and it was like, oh, you already published your contracts. Cool. We'll just pull them all in. That's great. Really easy. Um, and then for others, it is integrating with their systems or even dragging and dropping single contracts, um, again, as an alternative to sharing via email. Hi, my name is Rachel and I work for a vendor that contracts with local governments. And I'm wondering, I hear you say that it's a pretty 
um, effective and totally legal for governments to piggyback off of other contracts. Uh, but I'm wondering if the reason why we don't see governments doing that often is because of a lack of knowledge or what the unique hurdles are, especially in bigger contracts that prevent a government from being able to use somebody else's contract. So the average dollar spend off of a cooperative contract is actually larger at the local level than off of a contract that a government would create on its own. So um, it's about $90,000 um, versus about 72, 75, something like that. So there is a lot of buying activity that's happening. I would say the knowledge is very unevenly spread. So even within a purchasing department, um, if you're newer to purchasing, you know, you might not be as familiar. And I know Annie's done a lot of really awesome work to sort of let folks know. And then of course, also on the vendor side, um, like coming in and saying, no, 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 you can use this contract. Well, the risk is still mostly on the government side. So a lot of it also is making sure, hey, okay, I know this is okay. I won't get in trouble for using this. In fact, like all my boxes are checked. So I know Annie has like a nice little checklist that they've helped create and distribute, but I, I would say it's, it's sometimes hard to know for sure. And the risk of messing up feels very large. That's also one reason we see folks defaulting to just creating it on their own. Yeah, and I'd like to say that for government buyers out there, if you're there, um, <laughs> there are some resources um, that more and more are being put out there for us. Uh, there's this roadmap to cooperative purchasing, and actually as suppliers, it's actually out there if you guys want to look for it. Um, it's out there, and it helps you to explain and see what we need to include as cooperative language, just kind of what we do to compare and kind of benchmark contracts that have this cooperative language. Um, so more and more resources are being put out there for us, and I just think that that's that's just awesome. Thank you. Yeah, and the other, I mean, one of the one of the challenges that you'll see is that a lot of, a lot of times contracting officers or pur purchasing officials they're trained in one area, right? So they they only do con construction contracts, or they only do simplified acquisitions for IT, or they only do um, you know other commodities. Um, and so one of the things that we actually really need to do is we need to do a better job of communicating across silos, um, so that contracting officers who may not have, who may have never done a cooperative purchasing agreement and never purchased off of another contract understands that it's okay because we're doing a better job sharing our experiences and learning. Um, and so that, that's one of the other challenges that you often have these silos, even within a contracting office, um, so that people don't feel comfortable and uh, confident in using the right, uh, the right approach. Yeah, I think one piece we've sort of noticed, sorry, <laughs> is um, is also like the first question a lot of times for cooperative uh, folks that are searching on the platform and the tool that we're building is like, is what I need in this contract, right? Like even just figuring out the scope and that can be a mess depending on how your contracts are created. Um, the super savvy <laughs> and seasoned procurement folks are willing to look through like 200 pages of contracts if there's the promise that they might be able to purchase, um, make a better purchase. Um, the second question, of course, is can I use this contract? Like if this has the scope that I need, am I actually going to be breaking any rules if I purchase off of that contract? And so we're learning like, yes, cooperative purchasing is allowed across the country and supported, but there can be some slight nuances, jurisdiction to jurisdiction, that also can trip up vendors who are trying to be well-intentioned and say, you can use this contract, but might not know actually the local rules and also the purchasing staff. So like one of the wrinkles that we learned about um, working with the greater Portland metro area is actually, um, you know, if you want to use the cooperative contract in Oregon, you better have put that out for bid and advertised it in the state. Um, and so it's not every single contract that you could use with cooperative language. There's a little bit more requirements. And so you see some of that variation, which also makes it tough, but it's also cool because those are rules and, you know, like the logic can also be baked into the tools that we're developing. So that's exciting. So we've got one last question. Uh, you've just started to, to address this, so this may feel redundant, but I'll, I'll try to be uh, request a more thorough response. The, the fact that you've placed a contract on your platform indicates, implies that it's a good contract. And, uh, and, yet, and yet there are mistakes that happen in those and hopefully they are, they're kept to that one single occurrence because every subsequent contract is independently created. But now you're, you're potentially spreading a single mistake into more jurisdictions. So how thorough is your internal process to ensure that the contract is well, dra well drafted? Yeah, great question. One that we also think a lot about. Um, and we are not equipped to handle yet, but want to bake in uh, longer term to the work that we're doing. So um, the way it works right now is you can't evaluate. You just can see, hey, um, there's a contract here who created the contract. What does their process look like? Um, the next step is actually being able to track, hey, who's used that contract? 
So um, that that feedback loop isn't as strong yet. Um, and in fact, there's a whole economics of cooperative purchasing, which we didn't introduce or get into, um, around, uh, you know, basically like when you have a contract and you're using that contract to make more sales, oftentimes the vendor is supposed to self-report the sales back to that original authoring agency that helped invest the time and resources to hopefully think through a really good contract. So the more it's utilized, um, that should give some indication, at least it's been used by others, and what feedback have they had about it. Um, so that's kind of the next, like, more immediate horizon. And I know this is something you've we've yeah. thought a lot about as well, so I don't know if you have anything to add. Yeah, I've actually asked the same kinds of questions. Like, how do I know that this is going to be a good contract? Well, at the end of the day, I know that as a contract manager, it is up to me to review all terms and conditions of that contract to make sure it is going to be good for me and good for my agency. Um, that's called due diligence, right? We got to do our own due diligence check. And I know I'm preaching to the choir. You guys are all in procurement, but we've got to do that. Um, not one contract is going to be a one size fits all, 100%. But the nice thing is, when I see contracts out there for things like interpretation services, which is something that I'm actually going out to bid for, I can actually glean from that contract and start my market research right there. Someone else has already kind of gone through and thought about how to phrase these requirements because you know what? I'm not a technical writer either, but someone else has very eloquently put it in plain English just a little bit better than I could have. So I'm going to adopt some of that language and I will put it in my contract. So. I think one other piece that yeah. comes up a lot is just um, there are so many ways to write a bid and to write a solicitation. Um, I remember when I was leaving government, I was really, uh, I was really obsessed with this idea of like, what would a common application for procurement look like? Like, how could we standardize or move toward a more standardized way to write and evaluate um, and manage these contracts? And um, the common application in education, of course, was a bunch of universities getting together and saying, this is now our standard and we'll accept this. Um, I think our longer term picture is we can kind of come to more standardization and, and better conversations about what's working well, what's not working, when we actually when we actually have enough data and folks like participating in a place to share those conversations. So I think overall we're excited to get a better glimpse of how do you write a really good contract for software? How do you write a really good contract for job order contracting? Um, and what are those different approaches? And how can you, again, kind of compare and benchmark and ultimately choose um, the one that's the right one for your agency? But don't just stop at the contract. You can't, you can't just say, I've got a perfect contract. Everything is going to go great. Again, you have to focus on what happens after the contract is awarded and make sure that you've got the right, uh, the right team and the right oversight and the right management all the way through. Um, and that really is the fundamental act of what we have to do. It's not just buying the thing. It's actually delivering the value to the public. Thank you so much. Please join me in thanking Dave, Marielle, and Annie. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Thanks, Corey. This rounds out our 2019 Code for America Summit main stage. Oh, hey, Dan. Surprise. Um, we have been delighted to spend the last few days with you. Thank you for watching along on the live stream. Thank you for joining us here in Oakland. We look forward to seeing you next year in Washington, DC. In the meantime, if you were in this session, please be sure to pull out your trusty app and evaluate this session. Um, you can do it do on the app or on the website. those evaluations. Yes. Thank you, thank you. All right. All right. Um, OK, we're heading into our break. Um, we'll be back at 4 o'clock with Town Hall and the ELGL GovLove Live podcast. We will. We'll see you there. And thanks again for joining us on the live stream. See you next year.